um, and then direct drill using the, we used to uh, mooring drill on both of them, we'd use the cross slot at times, um, you know, a variety of drills as the direct drill, depends what's around. And just to give you um, an idea of what's about, um, these were the plants from the power harrows where we had really good establishment, almost 100% establishment of seeds. So we ended up with quite high plant populations. And of course, in all seed rate, you never know what plant populations you're going to end up with because you haven't got seed dressing, near nick seed dressing. Um, and um, then um, uh, we went on and the mint hills are the kind of middle of the ground job. These ones. And the plants were looking more like this. So if I give these to Tony, you can kind of hand them out. Um, and, uh, Take one home, <laughs> and then the trees were coming out of the direct drill. Now these were on kind of 12 to 14 plants per meter squared, which 10 plants is considered the, you know, and it, below 10 plants is, is uh, considered an uneconomic crop. Literally the combine finished in there about 7.30 last night and uh, we put everything over the Weybridge and uh, the yields came out as um, 3.8 tonnes a hectare on the direct drill, 3.7 tonnes a hectare on the mint hill and 3.64 on the plough. Um, now bearing in mind we've had the extremely dry summer, uh, we've been running these trials for a number of years and got I have masses of students work on them and they collect loads and loads of data for you know dissertation projects but an interesting one about this was looking at weed populations as well because yesterday we were filming out with country file diaries out there who say oh well, that's the panacea isn't it they, you know it, it was difficult because back in the winter it, it wasn't looking so great when we were at kind of 10 12 plants per meter squared and it shows how you have to hold your nerve a bit the number of black grass plants out there per meter squared was uh, about 250 plants per meter squared. Uh, Mint Hill was about 125, and the plough was about 25 plants per meter squared. Um, obviously, we, because um, uh, it's not in the organic system, we controlled them. So that's what it looked like, black grass wise, in the direct drill, and then after the perm. Um, and I would have said actually the black grass was pretty even amongst them all by our post chemical. Um, so that's just a quick run through, but uh, that's on the replicated field trials, masses of data. This field here is drilled with the Missouri drill and... Um, uh, excuse me, yeah. uh, what's the um, gross margin difference? Um, yeah, so I haven't, because literally I got the data last night. Um, but over time, basically we're looking at a drilling cost of about 9,500 pounds a hectare for the plough base system. Um, and about the same for the mint hill actually because you're looking at about 45 pounds a hectare for a top down or something like that to go through which comes out much the same price as a plough and then depending on what drill and what the contractor's doing um, but uh, probably about 65 pounds a hectare for establishing the um, the direct drill crop so you've got a kind of 40 pounds a hectare saving there um, and we've got a higher yield off the Mint Hill this year. Um, the big point, the big take home message I would say from this project over the eight years of harvest is that if we're going to have really dry periods, less soil movement. If we're going to have wet, lots of wet periods, and remember it was, we didn't have a really wet winter, but it felt wet at times. Then uh, in wet summers, the plough seems to do slightly better in those conditions. And until we have better forecasting systems, how on earth do we react to that, um, really? I mean, I think probably with the, uh, <clears throat> with the, with the Aussie rate plot this year, when we were walking across from the students in January, they were looking at the, the direct drill ones and saying, these are terrible. And I probably, and I agreed with them. And uh, I was probably slightly surprised at the year results yesterday, to be fair. I mean, the big plants that we have are obviously going to compensate. Um, <laughs> But I think we, with flea beetle becoming such a big issue for us now, um, we ended up in the direct drill box uh, with a very low seed rate, mainly because of flea beetle. There was slug activity, I was controlling the slugs, and I actually, I tend to try and blanket treat all the crops together, um, so, so that the only differential is, is the establishment system. 
so I was actually putting slug pallets on them until when I probably didn't need to, but I needed to put them on the direct drill, and even the fly power hour had a bit more slug activity. Uh, the slug activity wasn't horrendous, but I could control the slugs, I wasn't controlling the feeding. So I think I would still be nervous commercially direct drilling or seed rake. Uh, we had a field of or seed rake next door, direct drilled with the Claydon, uh, which did just over three tons per hectare. Um, that had uh, an extra two doses of slug pellets compared with my mini tank that was still seed rake, and it had uh, an extra insecticide spray as well, um, just to try and get on top of the So I, I think trying to get those established now with the feed rate capacity that we've got now, it's not going to be a horrendous hit, I think. Um, I would be looking to try and get as good a seed rate condition as, as I can and actually plant more by what the upcoming weather is doing rather than by calendar dates so that we will be able to get the ground running and coming through and, and, and hopefully able to feed rate. What was the moisture content? Uh, the moisture content was uh, about uh, seven and a half. No, the, the, the rape in this trial was drilled with the clay, with the clay. Um, the direct drill is, we, the more uni drill that we used on the Mintel, was, I was using the more uni drill, the Mintel drill, not a direct drill. So the also rape that was established in this trial was established with the clay. Um, just to show you what that looked like in the plot, it, um, you know, there's the direct drill, um, there's the direct drill uh, with the kind of less dense stand. Um, you can see the level of weed control in there um, against the plough where you have many stems um, and less branch crop. Uh, and actually, if you look at the greenness, this was about a week before harvest. Um, you can see that this was probably still more actively growing. Um, than, um, than the uh, plough. Wendy, could you talk about the uh, mustard and rape as far as... Yeah, point? we also, in conjunction with NIAB tag last year, we had a look at um, using white mustard uh, as a cover crop uh, to, uh, uh, as, a, as an aid to controlling uh, feed rate damage. Um, and we did a, um, a six kilo and a three kilo rate of mustard per hectare uh, on using clear field uh, or seed rape. So I was applying my Coranda herbicide in, in sort of October to uh, take out all the food plus the mustard. Um, we did, let's say, we did two, two separate rates and we left, uh, had a section untreated. Uh, one half of the field had no insecticide at all and the other half of the field had, had one insecticide. So I had insecticide across all three treatments and no insecticide across all three treatments. Um, we didn't put a plot combine into it because it was uh, it was just done as a bit of a look see. Um, NIAB has collected a lot of data on uh, sort of water establishment, etc. And the conclusion is that it definitely made quite a big difference. Um, and my conclusion was that six kilos is far too much. Um, and next year we're doing it. We're doing it at three kilos a minute. Um, I had a I had an RC rate crop sat underneath it trying to be a brilliant mustard. And it's amazing how slowly Karanda works when, when you want the mustard to touch. <laughs> um, but it, it did do a job on, on feed rate control. So next year we'll actually do it um, and uh, do a little bit more scientifically and, uh, and hopefully not do at the end of the year. Um, and again, that was just simply uh, part of the RC rate crop that just went across with a with the quality of the slug pellet on the back and then stand the mustard on. So that's that's when we will we'll expand next year. And what we're trying to do uh, with both of NIAB, TAG, uh, FASA, FCF, etc., anything that we can build in that benefits our students and I think the industry partners sort of joining forces with us to, to sort of tease out some more of the technical information when it works, it works out for everybody. So that's what we're aiming to do. Nikki. I'm here. Good, good, good. Uh, yeah, just, just a quick one on the viability of oil seed rape and the environmentalists and the thing with um, rape beetle, yeah, seed really. beetle. What I've noticed on my studies, and I, I do private bird surveys, 
surprise the clients, but what I've noticed by my observations is when I'm looking at the Pedro birds in the latter part of June and after it's flowered, they're absolutely rampacked with songbirds, these cover, um, the cover crops and the, and the, mate, um, the rape crops. And there's songbirds in there, I bet you've seen them yes, yourself, yes. dunnocks, thrushes, blackbirds, they're all white throats. So you've got migrant birds, you've got your resident birds, all in the ca canopy, they feel safe I guess, but there must be plenty of food there as well. So if we lose rape, we will be negatively affected the songbirds, I'm pretty sure. Right. Field lab on intercropping and companion cropping. Um, and so that's basically looking, it's bringing together farmers their experience based on the fact that most of innovation with intercropping and companion cropping is happening in farmers' fields. Um, so we've got over 20 people in the group, 12 of those are doing different trials on different plant teams this year, um, and then we are sharing data and information. Um, and everyone is, is kind of agreed that they will um, look at yield and gross margin as kind of the two key indicators because obviously if you're looking at completely different plant combinations then you've got different objectives, you've got different things that you're looking to measure. Um, so they, the different farms could be loosely grouped into um, oilseed rape and companion uh, crops um, and grain legumes um, and then cereals and grain legumes and then under sowing and direct drilling into um, permanent covers basically so looking at white cover clover understory um so I will, i'll just pass around some, some paraphernalia just to have a look at as we go um, and i'll also just give a quick overview so we've got um this is one member of the group this is mark lee who's over in shropshire he's got tris kayley and carlin peas his objective mainly is looking at how can that kayley hold up his peas um carlin peas though, have a lot of biomass they tend to end up on the floor um, so he's trying different <laughs> seed rates of triticale um, in a standard seed rate of the carlin peas. Um, at the moment his kind of gut feeling is that 10% of the recommended density is um, where he wants to be. Um, but we're going to go back and do some analysis on that in terms of looking at the degree of lodging in the different seed rates. Another one that you might have come across is Andy Howard, so over in Kent. Um, as part of his, he's tried lots of different combinations, we'd be here all day if I was to tell you about all of them. Um, but what he's trying here is obviously breaking beans um, with multiple objectives really. He's looking at weed suppression, he's looking at pests, flea beetle control, pest suppression, um, and he's also looking at um, reducing inputs basically. So this year he's not also not using any pesticides, he's not used any um, bagged nitrogen either, um, and he's done tissue analysis on the, his obviously rape, and he's got everything there that he needs. So. Um, yeah, so both of those um, basically uh, were drilled mixed in the hopper. Um, this one was a cross slot, the other one was um, just a standard drill and they were mixed in the hopper. Rape and beans in the same hopper. No, that was with a cross slot, sorry, that was incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> the other, <laughs> sorry, the, the other, the triticale and peas was mixed in the hopper and this was, uh, um, yeah, he's used a cross slot so he's got multiple hoppers from there. Um, so yeah, he's, we're looking at multiple things there, we're going to go back um, and look at um, do some yield for drag cups. Um, and then I will hand over to James to tell us about what he's up to. Thank you. Um, got pictures for okay. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm James Hairs. Um, we are organic beef and arable farmers, just over the way near Swindon. Um, really, our objective was to get some kind of weed control in our beans because, as my dad, who's over there, will tell you, our last year's beans were pretty disastrous. In fact, we had a massive load of thistles where we didn't have beans. So, yes, that was our, that was our objective. I mean, any yield increases, the theory is that, I mean, you know, Andy Howard has said that he's got a yield increase with his intercropping, but as far as we're concerned, that would be a bonus. We just need to get on top of our weeds. Uh, we planted um, ours in October, so 23rd of October, we drilled tundra beans at 175 kilos per hectare, and we did like a half rate for us of Malika. We, we're on extremely heavy soil, by the way. We have very, very deep clay soils, so our seed rates will probably be a bit different. Um, <coughs> but, so half rate of Malika for us, which is 125 kilos per hectare. That was done with a time drill, it was all done on the same day. So we didn't. So everything after that, we had the same start point. So it's fairly easy for the trial. Um, we did 
kind of like visual inspections as we went along, we definitely found that it looked like there were less weeds in our intercropping than there were in the control. But I mean, when we went along and did um, five kind of quadrant cuts in each, and we ended up with, I think, was it 62% reduction? 62%. Some of them had got over 100% less weeds. Some of them over 100% less weeds. Okay, well, that's good. Some of them. So, so an average of 62% less weed biomass in our trial than in the control, which is obviously exactly what we were after. So we're quite happy from that point of view. Obviously, we still have an absolute ton of wild oats because we deliberately did it in a patch we knew was bad because we figured if it worked there, it would probably pretty much work anywhere on the farm. Um, yeah, our harvest end use is really for feed because we're a beef, organic beef farm. We don't need to separate our crop, so we will obviously find out the percentages of the wheat <coughs> and the beans so we can adjust our ration, but we're not actually looking to separate it, unlike Andy Howard, who's got an incredible machine, which I went and, went and saw, uh, separating out everything. Yeah. Yeah, you can see it, Andy's separator on the YouTube channel. Yeah, it's a very impressive homemade machine. Um, throughout the kind of throughout the year, we noticed that pretty much every time we looked at it, our intercropping beans were about one to two growth stages ahead of our control. So it seems to be having some kind of impact on how it grows. We're not, I'm not entirely sure about that kind of bit, but it certainly flowered uh, two days before the um, control did. What I've, what, I'm no expert at all, but and perhaps Christine might have more thoughts on this, but there's meant to be something that helps pheromones that, between the plants that um, encourage them to ripen at the same time, kind of like when you put your bananas and your um, apples together. <laughs> um, so there might be something in that that's bringing on the flowering. I think Andy's seeing the same thing in his beans as well. Oh, no, 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 let me see. Yes, Christine, do you want to go up to... <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Um, I just wanted to say something about, um, uh, well, actually, two EU projects that I think can mention that, that uh, have been funded under Horizon 2020. Um, there's one called Diversify, which ORC are a partner in, which is, the, which is this one. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a, a twin project or a sister project called Remix, uh, led by INRA, in which SIUC are a partner. So in, in that project, we have uh, 11, what are called, multi-actor platforms uh, across Europe, which are groups, groups of farmers prepared to grow uh, cereal legume intercrops. And in that project, particularly focused on uh, a human consumption endpoint. So we have a multi-actor platform in Scotland, but it's kind of become Greater Scotland because Kent and <laughs> Andy Howard uh, is now a partner. Um, so what we are interested in, in doing in that is a number of things, including having a, a machinery company in Denmark uh, involved in, in trying to um, develop a new combine which will harvest and separate in the field and not damage either the, the legume or the cereal, which tends to be the, the problem when you combine the two species together. Um, we're also very interested in, in hearing from any practitioners or researchers um, about sort of management of uh, intercrops in, in organic and conventional systems and Nicola we're particularly interested in, in any kind of unpublished material that we could incorporate into developing better management guidelines for those kind of systems so if you if you're aware of work or have experience and would like to tell us about it we'd love to hear from you okay um what we're going to do now is uh, I'd like you to just look in this crop as you walk up. We're going to walk up to the field there where we're going to go in the grass and have a chat about grassland. But this is the uh, Missouri.